Yo, comrades! So, we're definitely raised in a society that really favours competition. It puts competition up on a pedestal. It thinks it's, it's a necessary and important and good thing. I mean, from birth, you're raised in this kind of institutionalized, indoctrinated world, this society, this game, this, this, these rules that tell you that competition is necessary and important. And it's so entrenched that if you try and have an argument, you try and have a discussion with someone uh, saying that competition is a bad thing, that we should actually remove that, that it's actually not a good thing, let's see where that goes. I think when you say that you're against competition or you think that competition is not necessarily a good thing, people, people immediately put you on the other side of the spectrum and kind of assume that you're a communist or you're against people getting ahead. I think most people kind of associate this concept, this abstract kind of model of competition to freedom. They intrinsically link the two. And that makes sense. Like in a free market, you have the opportunities to do what you want. But I think in our society as it exists today, I think it's kind of like a bit of a sick culture because what competition really means is that there is artificial scarcity and we're competing for that scarcity. We have more than enough resources and technology on this planet to provide absolute abundance, to feed everyone, to clothe everyone on the entire planet and to have everyone have and live a very comfortable, happy life. But then we have money, which is an artificial scarcity. It's literally just the numbers created out of thin air. Um, and then we have to compete for that artificial scarcity because there's only so much of it everyone can have to share. And so then you're born into a culture which actually, you know, <laughs> the entire thing is built around the scarcity of that, that money, the scarcity of that aspect, and so competition is a necessary factor. When you're a toddler and there's only like one toy, you're kind of taught to share, but that never really happens. There's this kind of like innate human desire to want to like have that toy. It's like there's only one, so it's mine. Then your first few years of schooling are all about play and exploration and art and trying to like, you know, social behaviors and getting along with each other, but then very quickly it becomes this whole examination, compete with each other, get better school. I mean, think about like every single examination, every single test, every single like class project. Um, you're basically ranking and rating students. I mean, I, I used to always compare my marks with everyone else. And of course, I was always first. <laughs> I was like uh, ducks of like, I think year 7 to 11 every single year. Pretty much first in maths, first in physics, first in science, first in English many years as well. And it's weird, like that definitely strokes the ego for no real reason. It's just artificial. Um, uh, and it definitely uh, propelled me on to compete and beat the other kids. But it's a really bad trait to be instilling in a kid. But then what happens, like you get to the end of high school and really you've got to compete for the best marks so you can actually get into university because there's a scarcity of places. Why is there a scarcity of places? It's artificial. You get into the university degree you want to do and then you compete to get the best marks to actually then look better on your resume to compete for jobs in the market. And then you're competing against all these other people for the best job. Yeah. And then of course the entire business world, every single business, every single company, they're all competing against each other for, again, scarce resources, money. They're competing to get the most customers, to get the most revenue, the most profits. And yes, competition is good if it means better services and more value and more progress for humanity, for consumers. But ultimately, what it tends to do is just create redundancies and inefficiencies. And if you're a company, competition is actually bad. So Peter Thiel talks about this. He talks about, you know, you shouldn't have any competitors. You want to have a monopoly. You want to have the first mover advantage, lock in that network effect and have the monopoly. But therein lies the problem because we live in a world that's so interconnected that you can have millions or billions of customers, uh, users and consumers um, locked onto your platform. So you hold that network effect monopoly. Facebook is like the darling of the startup world, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's touted as like the best entrepreneur ever, and it, it's because he's managed to lock in so much network value, no one's going to leave Facebook. And now they're so big, they've got such a network effect, such a monopoly, that no one can, can even compete with Facebook. It's actually laughed off if anyone says they want to build a Facebook competitor in the startup community. And then that's where the redundancies and the inefficiencies come into play because, um, you know, you can't basically export your social data, your friends list, and then like just transfer them to another platform. They're locked to Facebook. And so this reduces consumer and user kind of choice because no one's going to be creating a Facebook competitor. No one's like, no one can because they have such a network effect and they can't access that data freely. If you create a better version of Facebook, a better social network, you basically have to start from scratch. You have to encourage everyone to sign up with brand new user accounts, enter in all their friends, invite all their friends across. In an ideal world, and this is the whole point of the blockchain, in an ideal world, Facebook would basically add all that data, all the social data, all your friends list to an open blockchain, an open database. Meaning if you could sign up to a brand new social network tomorrow and just like one click log in and instantly you've got access to all your data, all your friends list, and you can interact with all your friends without them even being on there. That then creates good competition because then people will be competing to create better services and not competing on who can control the most users and lock in the most data because the database is open and shared. Another perfect example here is banks. I mean, uh, people actually stay with their banks longer than their partners. Uh, I read, I was watching some video recently that did that. And that's partly because they lock them in. It's hard to change your bank. 
And because banks lock their, their users, their customers in uh, for like 20 plus years, their entire life basically, and they make so much money, there is very little incentive for them to offer better service. Banks to this day still don't offer you a really quick and easy way to pay people online without having to enter in all their, their bank account details and like send them and you know, it takes three days to process and all that shit. A great example I heard recently is like, say you need to email something to someone, you just grab their email address. You don't need to know what client they're using, whether they're using Outlook or Gmail or Hotmail, it doesn't matter. But if you say, hey, thanks Johnny, thanks for that concert ticket, let me just send you 20 bucks for it. Now it becomes a game of 20 questions. It's like, okay, well, uh, what's your PayPal address? Or like, well, are you going to send it on Venmo? Or like, there will quite literally be tens of thousands of payment startups out there right now that are all trying to do the exact same thing. And we're talking about fucking payments. It should be the most simple, basic thing ever. And so that's, this is another thing where blockchain could basically fix that. Um, if, if everyone just used Bitcoin, then that kind of becomes this standard-based protocol, and then all these payment startups and services just plug into that. But Bitcoin's still a little bit too hard to use right now, um, so they probably should fix that. Another example, real estate. Okay, so there are so in Australia, the big monopoly, the, the one that owns the most real estate, the most database, is realestate.com.au. They're basically the monopoly because they have the network effect. There are hundreds, possibly thousands of other real estate listing sites that are essentially are doing the exact same thing. They're either all scraping each other for that data, and they all look the same, they're all competing, but for what? If instead all of that real estate listing data, all the, the listings, the photos, the contact details, all that was on a blockchain and open for anyone to use, and everyone just plugged into it, then you wouldn't need to have that. Another very apparent, complete inefficiency in the market right now that I've noticed is trying to find a fucking room in Sydney. So here's the process so far. So someone's trying to rent out a room. They have you know, a price attached to it, uh, photos, details, when it's available, other types of criteria. So what do they do? They post it to multiple places. So they might post it to realestate.com.au, they might post it to Gumtree, they might post it to, I uh, think, or flatmates.com.au, flatmatefinders.com.au, um, Facebook groups, all these different places. Then as the person looking for a room, I then have to individually and very manually check each of those places, manually read through each of them, try and find the one I'm looking for. Then I have to message them, and I don't know, like, there's no like application process, it's more of just like a messaging thing, it's a very uh, manual, subjective thing, and you're competing against 50 other people doing the same thing. If all that data and all these competing websites, instead of running their own data silos, their own databases, if they instead all operate on the single database, it'd make the whole thing so much more efficient. The person with the room could go to any front-end website they want. You know, they could go to Gumtree, realestate.com, flatmates, whatever, and they create the listing once. They enter in all the specific details about the, the room or the property they're renting and the exact criteria of the person and price and everything they're looking for. They create it once. I then go to whatever front-end I prefer as well, like any of those competing websites, and I enter in the criteria I'm looking for once. Paired to this would be a, a kind of like a reputation, a decentralized reputation of all of my past rental history and references and everything. So that wouldn't have to be a manual process where you have to check the person out. And then this blockchain-based system would basically just instantly match people. If there's, a, if there's a request that matches a person, done. Here you go, connect them together via chat, done. And while blockchain-based developer platforms like Ethereum can actually help solve some of these efficiencies, I noticed that because this competition, entrepreneurial, startup mindset is so ingrained, people are coming at it the wrong way. Like as an example, if someone wants to create a, a real estate listing platform on the blockchain, they'll come at it from the point of view of like, okay, we'll make our thing on the blockchain, but no one can plug into it. We keep, we'll keep all the data and we'll control it all. Like they'll create their version of a listing website, but their backend will be running on the blockchain. So they'll think they're all cool and fancy and stuff, but they'll be like, we control that data and you know, we'll become the biggest one. I mean, ideally what they should be doing is like, they should be working on their front end version, like their listing website, but they should be creating this back end database that everyone plugs into and that everyone wants to plug into. I mean, ideally what these groups should do is like Zillow and Trulia and realestate.com.au and uh, anyone else who wants to work on real estate stuff should get together and work on an open cooperative backend. So what they do is like they'd all work together in, in a very non-competitive way on this backend to create one DAO, one smart contract that has a decentralized database of all real estate in the world. But you'd have to structure it in such a way that no one group has more control than the other. Everyone, it, it's a cooperative, it's a pure cooperative. Anyone can plug into it without permission. And this is how I've been thinking about designing my peer-to-peer -peer economy. So, you know, I want this, this base backend to be completely open and accessible and anyone can plug into it and I don't control it. So that all the data is uniform, standard, accessible, all the skill sets, all the levels, all the currencies, all, all standard. And the competition happens on the front end, the user experience. I think what you can do is actually remove competition between humans in such an economy so that humans always have abundance, they're never competing over scarcity, they're all helping and cooperating with each other. Everyone in the world would have equal opportunity and equal freedom to move up and down class systems. It'd be a, it'd be a meritocracy, but it would be completely fluid, up and down, wherever you want. 
So you'd never be competing for jobs, you'd never be applying for jobs, there'd never be a bidding process, uh, there'd never be like, you know, <laughs> uh, resumes or any type of like competition between humans. Where competition would make sense is between bots and automation. So if you can automate people's problems, then competition is a good thing because then the bots are competing, not humans. Because the bots would be competing on efficiency, on actual data, they'd be A-B tested against each other, um, and the bots are really about automating things in society that we can get rid of to give humans a better life. These bots would be nameless and brandless. This completely eradicates marketing and advertising. I want that out of our economy. I think that's a really bad inefficiency. It makes people buy shit they don't need. Bots become the new companies, the new businesses, um, and they, they can still have their own hierarchies, but they can be made by one person or 10,000. It doesn't matter. But they're all competing on efficiency. And so if a bot does achieve 100% automation, it becomes the perfect monopoly. But that's actually great because that adds value back to humanity. It's not a bad monopoly, it's an awesome monopoly. And hopefully with these type of concepts, and I'm still developing this, these concepts, uh, hopefully with all these combined, it dissolves the hierarchies and centralization in our society, which removes competition altogether. If you've ever been to something like a bush store for Burning Man, you really feel the love and cooperation. It's like everyone's in it together. You know, everyone's helping each other out. They're not competing over scarcity. And I truly think we have the ability right now to create a global economy that removes negative competition, removes the inefficiencies and redundancies, and creates a global collective where we all share in abundance and work on audacious goals together.